Hi, welcome to the Midtown Vineyard Podcast. We're so glad you've joined us online. For daily encouragement, events, service times, and more, check out our website and social media. And now, this week's message. So uh, I had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home. And I know that isn't everyone's story, but I'm thankful that it's a part of mine. I was blessed with two parents who really saw that the most important thing they could teach me is who Jesus is. Um, So much so that they enrolled myself and my sisters in uh, a Christian school very early on. And part of that school is that like every morning you, you start your, your day, you start your school day uh, with a time of, of reading the Bible, of Bible classes. As you get older, those get a little more intense. And so um, throughout my life, I have just been kind of inundated and steeped in the Bible. And I'm, I'm really thankful for that upbringing, but it's not without a set of challenges. And I'm going to be really careful because my mom is like right there, but... <laughs> Over the years, having been brought up in a, a, a more, you know, conservative Southern Baptist kind of way, I uh, have had to unlearn and relearn a few different things through, throughout my, my life, right? Um, for example, for example, uh, I, I got saved, and I, I put that in quotes because I have a very complicated history and relationship with salvation, and I sometimes tell people I've been saved three times. But the first time, the first time was at my Christian school in kindergarten. So I I was roughly five or six years old. And I don't remember much about that time of my life, but I remember that morning very, very vividly. And I think you'll see why very soon. But um, the teacher kind of sat us all on a rug, semicircle style, and pulled out the, pu- the little packet of curriculum as she sat down in a rocking chair and began to read us a-, a Bible story. And the story that we happened to be in that morning was uh, the story of Lazarus and the rich man, which if you're familiar with, then you might know where I'm going, but if you're not familiar with it, let me give you a, a quick recap of it. It's a parable or a story that Jesus tells about a, a poor, sickly, decrepit beggar named Lazarus. Lazarus sits outside of the home of a rich man every single day. And as the rich man passes by, he begs for just scraps from the rich man's table. So the stuff that you and I scrape into the trash after we've had too much to eat, Lazarus is begging for just that. Just give me that and I'll be be okay. And day in and day out, Jesus tells us that the rich man ignores Lazarus and continues on in his life. So Jesus sets the stage of this story with these two characters who are just diametrically opposed in lifestyle, but much like all of us, uh, the end of the story is pretty similar. They, they die. That's like the one thing that all of us have in common in this room is that one day we're, we're going to die, right? And so Jesus tells that, that Lazarus, when he died, that Angels came down and they took his spirit up to a place called Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side. I don't have time to unpack Second Temple Judaism this morning and their views of the afterlife. If you want to have a conversation about that, please email Tommy at midtownvineyard.org. I know he would be more than happy to answer all of those questions about all of that. But this, this place that Lazarus goes to is what I would, I would describe as movie heaven. And what I mean by that is like when you think of just kind of the stereotypical idea of heaven in your head, this is kind of what's described. It's light and airy and there are clouds and it's blissful and all of this. But that's not where the rich man goes when he dies. There, there are no angels. There's no Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side. There, there's a place that Jesus called Hades. And... Jesus describes Hades kind of the way we would think of a a very stereotypical caricature of hell, right? Like fire and brimstone and pain and agony and suffering and all of that. That's where the rich man ends up. And during his time there, he looks up and he sees like a, a great chasm or an expanse. And on the other side, 
he sees Lazarus with, with Abraham. And he begins to speak to them and he begs Abraham just to dip his, his finger in some water and put a drop of water on his tongue so that he can be quenched of his thirst and it might ease some of the agony that he's in. And Abraham says, well, I can't do that. Even if I wanted to, I can't cross this expanse between us. There's no way for me to get to you or for you to get to me. So then the rich man kind of changes the terms of the deal and says, well, I've got five brothers and I can't let them come here. So can you go warn them? And Abraham says, well, no, I can't. No, that's absurd. I can't do that. And then finally, in a last ditch effort, the rich man says, well, send Lazarus back so he can warn them. They'll believe if they hear from Lazarus, which implies that the rich man's probably also wealthy brothers knew Lazarus and also ignored him similarly. Just throwing that out there. But Abraham finally says like, no, we, we can't do that. And Jesus, as he's telling this story, says this really cheeky thing that I imagine he said with a grin on his face as he delivered it, which is that, hey, they have Moses and the prophets, meaning the scriptures. And if they don't believe them, they're not going to believe if someone rises from the dead. Kind of a central theme of Jesus's teaching here. But that's how the story ends. Like that, that narrative cuts off right there. There's no happy ending, no resolution. That is how that ends. And it's how it ended that morning for me as a five-year-old sitting on my teacher's rug listening to this story. And not only was this the story we were listening to, but the, the great thing about the curriculum that our school used was that it had these kind of painterly illustrations of each of these stories. And I couldn't find the exact one that I remember seeing, but I found one that's very, very similar, very close, and we have that if we can throw that on the screen. Right, that's what I said. <laughs> so clearly, the rich man is not having a great time. I'd like to remind you that I was five years old. Six at the most. At the end of this story, the teacher kind of sat down the little packet of curriculum and said, now how many of you want to go to heaven when you die? I don't work in sales for a living. That's not my gifting. I feel confident that I could close that sale. 10 out of 10 five-year-olds, when polled, will prefer heaven over hell when they die. <laughs> Don't quote me on that, because if toddlers have taught me that kids are crazy and they'll do and say anything. So. But this was kind of how Jesus was introduced to me as a child. And so naturally, my hand shot up. A lot of other kids did. The teacher led us through the sinner's prayer, and that was it. I was a Christian at that point. And I got baptized at my church not long after, and that set me on the trajectory that I'm on now. But something else happened that, that day. There was a paradigm that was kind of imprinted on my really young, really impressionable brain that this was eternal life. This is kind of what it was about. Like, my idea of eternal life became that, you know, here I am on earth, right? Like a giant floating rock in space. That's where we all are. I'm in a body, and it's not great, but it'll do. I have a soul. It's probably not great either, but it'll do. And one day, I'm going to die, hopefully after 70 plus years and living a full life. And then when I die... My soul is going to continue to live on. And, you know, if I've believed the right thing about Jesus, then I'm going to go up to the good place. And if I haven't believed the right thing about Jesus, then I'll go down to the bad place or, or hell, you know, the place that's reserved for murderers and, and thieves and, and people who take their shoes off on airplanes. And I don't make the rules. Sorry, don't know what to tell you. But that was my idea of eternal life. So anytime I would come to the Bible and, and see the phrase eternal life, that is the idea that I had in my head, that eternal life was 
only about or primarily about where I go when I die. You could use the phrase fire insurance if you want. And some of you, some of you as I'm saying this, might be thinking like, oh, that's what I believe about eternal life. And there's, there's just one big glaring problem with that paradigm of eternal life. And that's the Bible. And before you uh, start throwing stones and running me out as a heretic, let me, let me explain what I mean here. I'm not saying the Bible is the problem. I'm saying that sometimes our reading and our interpretation of the Bible is the problem. So what we do sometimes is often we are given kind of a set of rules or doctrines or paradigms or ideas that we're told before we actually dig into the text of the Bible, well, this is what it means. And so then when we encounter things that kind of push up against that, or maybe it's not there at all, we start to panic. And in the worst cases, I think a lot of people leave the faith. And I think we're seeing that in the deconstruction movement today. It's not that people were handed the wrong Bible or anything like that. It's that they weren't taught to read it the way it was meant to be read. I have uh, just an illustration I can show about this. Um, There was a Babylon Bee article several years ago um, that says this, Bible lacking sinner's prayer returned for full refund. Now, if you're not familiar, Babylon Bee is a satirical (laughs) publication, so this is a joke. But it's so indicative of how we approach scripture from time to time. Like we have this set of ideas in our head that maybe aren't as clear or don't line up or don't fit neatly. Like watching my two-year-old daughter try to fit a square block in a round hole in a, in a shape matching game that she has. Like it's just, it doesn't quite work. Maybe you can force it in there. If you're strong enough, maybe there's ways to get creative, but it wasn't designed to fit that way. Are you tracking with me? Perfect. And this was my issue with eternal life, right? I had the paradigm of eternal life is simply where you go when you die, which let me just be clear, like eternal life does concern that we live on forever, right? But my idea was that that was it. That was simply what it was talking about. And then I started reading the Bible more, especially when I was in college. That was the moment that I think Jesus really just took hold of my life and uh, really shaped me not into a nominal Christian, but into an apprentice under him in his way. And I started just studying the Bible like my life depended on it and reading people from outside of the theological tradition that I was raised in. And that really, really confused me for a minute because I would come to the Bible and think through concepts like eternal life and be like, that's not how it's described here. Eternal life is mentioned all throughout the Bible. It's mentioned roughly 41 times from cover to cover. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending on your translation. But 40 to 45 is a good estimate. 17 of those times are mentioned in the Gospel of John alone. So if you've been here since well before Easter, we've been going through the Gospel of John. Hopefully, you will remember like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I remember hearing a lot about eternal life throughout, you know, throughout the Gospel of John as we've been in it. One of the most famous passages in all of the Bible comes from the Gospel of John, John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but would have eternal life. life. Exactly. Eternal life is a concept that John, the author of this gospel, is obsessed with. He he lays out Jesus' teachings on eternal life throughout the gospel to point us toward a point that we're arriving at this morning in John chapter 17. But despite eternal life or everlasting life being mentioned 41 times throughout the Bible, 17 times in the gospel of John alone, it's given a definition only one time. So there is a hard definition of eternal life in the Bible, but there's only one. 
And it's in John chapter 17. And when it is defined, it's defined really clearly. The Bible can be confusing and daunting at times. We have to acknowledge that. This is not really one of those times. We're going to see that the way Jesus speaks about eternal life is with just laser focus and pinpoint accuracy so that he can articulate this point well. So in John chapter 17, starting in verse 1, it says, after he said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. Okay, time out right there, I know. What is this? What's all this? Everything that we've been talking about since Easter, the upper room discourse. Remember, Jesus was in an upper room with his disciples before he goes to the cross to die. He is teaching them about the nature of the kingdom of God. He's telling them to abide in him. It's where we get communion from. After he had said all of this, so Jesus has officially ended the discourse part of the upper room discourse. Discourse just means conversation. And John is using this this language as a literary clue for us. This is a clue that what we're about to read is, is the apex. It's the pinnacle of all that Jesus has said during this movement of Scripture. Are you tracking? Sweet. So we're meant to understand, like, okay, this is about to come to a climax, and it's going to come in the form of what some people call the high priestly prayer of Jesus. So he turns toward heaven and prays, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. That again, that's the language all throughout the gospel of John. Glorification, the exaltation, the lifting up of Jesus is going to come through the cross, not through an inauguration on a throne. It's going to come through a crown of thorns, not a crown of gold. So John uses that language to tell us like the glorification, the exaltation of Jesus is about to come, but it's going to be in a way most people don't expect. Jesus continues, for you granted him authority over all people that he might give what? Eternal life, right? To all those you have given him. So in this prayer, Jesus is is summing up everything that he came to do, to be glorified, lifted up on the cross, and to bring eternal life to everyone the Father gives him. And then in verse three, he says this, now this is eternal life, colon. This is the laser focus and the accuracy I was mentioning earlier, We're not going to get a clearer way that something is going to be defined in the Bible than saying, this is what it is. Like this this should cue our minds to begin to understand, okay, whatever is about to come is going to be what eternal life is. Are you with me? Perfect. Now this is eternal life that they would simply die and come to heaven to live with us one day. But that's what I was taught. What I was taught about eternal life was that it was something that happened to me when I died. And then that was it. But that's not what Jesus says here. We have to be careful around Jesus because he can really mess up our good theology. (laughs) Now this is eternal life that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's Jesus' definition of eternal life. Does that sound like the eternal life that maybe you were taught about? It's not the eternal life that I was taught about. So what is Jesus talking about? You know, in, in studying for this sermon and studying this concept, um, one phrase that really kept kind of coming to the surface that I'm borrowing from 
several other people is that it, it, the eternal life Jesus is talking about here is more about quality of life than it is quantity of life. It's more about quality than quantity. It is certainly quantitative, meaning dealing with time. Paul tells us that when we die, if we have placed our faith in Jesus, we are in Christ, right? There's something that happens next. We've used the language of heaven to describe that in the past. But that's not primarily what Jesus is is focused on here. Are Are you tracking? He describes eternal life as knowing God and knowing him. And this is just a crazy shift for a lot of us in the room, I'm sure. This was an an unbelievably radical change in my way of thinking and approaching Jesus from how I was raised. But it's a good one. It's a good one. So what does it mean when, when Jesus says that eternal life is knowing God? We can know a lot, right? We can know dates. We can know facts. I can know that the Dallas Mavericks are winning the NBA Finals this year. But in the Bible, when, when knowledge of God is talked about, it's not simply a, a fact or, or a, a thought process. Mm-mm. No, it's about a transformative and relational way of knowing someone. I think, I think that the way Jesus is, is trying to get us to think comes from, from verse 20 later on in this prayer. He's just finished praying for his disciples specifically, his apostles in the room with him. But in verse 20, he says this, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's you and me. We're the ones that believe in Jesus because of the apostles' message. I pray for them that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you have sent me. If you're like me and you have ADHD, you probably have to read that four or five times for that to click. But Jesus, I think here, is describing the kind of knowledge of God that he's talking about. That that, that before time began, right? This is kind of how the gospel of John begins. We get this, this incredible introduction that talks about Jesus being present before the foundations of the world, coexisting with the Father and the Spirit, the three of them kind of creating everything that we see, loving each other in perfect communal relationship as one God. We would call this the Trinity. That's what Orthodox Christianity would teach, but I I really like C.S. Lewis's language of it. He calls it the dance, it's beautiful, right? Like, because if you've ever seen incredible dancers performing, the way that they move, the way that they move is like moving as one. They're flowing off of each other. They're, they're leaning in and drawing back perfectly together in perfect harmony. And that, I think Jesus is saying here, that is, that is the nature of God's existence. And that's what he's inviting us into, that in the same way that he has always been in the Father and the Father has always been in him, now, through eternal life, he wants us to be in them. So we are invited through eternal life to to experience the life that God shares with himself. Jesus is saying here that he wants us to be so connected to him that we share in his life, in in God's life. When we think about this, this idea of union with God, you know, a great example is marriage. 
It's used all throughout the New Testament as a way to articulate the the nature of Christ in the church. We're told that uh, a husband leaves his family and is joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. That doesn't mean they become the same person, right? Like, we, we don't become God. We don't become the same person in marriage. I have not become my wife, Thank God my wife has not become me. That does sound like hell. Another me, I mean. I'm, she's a saint, bless her. But there's something about the two of us being so connected, sharing the same life and the same goal, that we can't be separated. That we, we share an inseparable life as as two that have become one. Are you tracking with me? Yeah. I think that's what Jesus is getting at here, is that eternal life is something not that simply happens to us when we die, but is a reality in which we are invited to be active participants in the life that God shares with himself. John Ortberg describes union with God not as the simple feeling of connectedness to God, but of our wills becoming his will through continual surrender. Your your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Right? I think that's the the union here that Jesus is talking about. That is the eternal life that he's talking about. It's not that, hey, good news, guys, you get to leave down here and go up there one day. But the good news is that, hey, if you you believe in me and and you allow me to, to give you my life, we can bring up there down here. And this is, the, this is the focal point of all of Christianity for most of our history. Like, it has not actually been until very recently on the timeline that the focus of Christianity became salvation from hell and to heaven when we die. All throughout church history, union with Christ has been the focal point of our faith. C.S. Lewis words it this way, that the whole offer which Christianity makes is this, that we can, if we let God have his way, come to share in the life of Christ. That's a different paradigm. And thankfully, when I die, I'm, I'm going to be with Christ. But that's not the end goal, right? Like, The Bible doesn't end with us going to heaven when we die. It it ends with heaven and earth being reunited and us being resurrected in God's new kingdom. But that kingdom doesn't just start when we die or when Jesus returns. It started when he came first. Like it started when he showed up on the scene and according to the gospel of Mark said, hey, The kingdom of God is at hand or has come near, repent and believe this gospel. And so our connectedness to God's life in Christ allows us to be active participants in the kingdom of God here and now. Not just when we die. Today. In John chapter five, Verse 24, Jesus says this, that I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. That's that's active language. That's current language. That's right now. Eternal life doesn't just begin when we die. It's available to us now to live in, to experience, because eternal life is 
knowing Jesus. Are you with me? To quote the philosopher Dallas Willard, eternity is, is now in session. So what do, we, what do we do with all of this, right? Because like, if you're like me, you're probably looking around at the world and saying, well, this doesn't feel like eternal life. It doesn't feel like heaven on earth. And I would just ask the question, what if we've misunderstood what the idea of a good life in Jesus is? In John chapter 10, Jesus says that he came to give life and to give it abundantly. So we believe wholeheartedly that the life that Jesus is inviting us to share in is a good life. So maybe our understanding of it is not fully accurate there. I think Jesus sums up what this new life in him, what this kingdom life looks like in his most famous teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, there's a section in it called the Beatitudes. You might be familiar. It's these nine blessing statements of Jesus. And they, they each begin, they're kind of poetic. They begin with blessed are the blank, right? The Greek word there is makarioi. Can you guys say makarioi? Makarioi, perfect. Makarioi can be translated as blessing. It can also be translated as happy or fruitful. So you could say happy is the one that dot, dot, dot. Fruitful is the one that dot, dot, dot. The complicated thing with the Greek that the New Testament was written in is that some of these words are really hard to wrap our heads around in modern English. So scholars have gone back and forth with like, how do we articulate what Jesus is actually saying here, because if you really dig into the etymology of the word, makarioi does not mean blessing in the sense that you and I understand it, where like we're given something good as a reward. It denotes a state of being that is joyful and spiritually prosperous despite outside circumstances. One of my favorite uh, scholars, Dr. Tim Mackey, says that, you know, I think the best way we could articulate what Jesus is, is getting at here is to translate blessed to the good life. So instead of saying blessed are dot, 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 we could say the good life belongs to dot, dot, dot. Following that train of thought, I think it's very logical to say, well, we, we could interject eternal life here. We could translate this as eternal life, right? That eternal life belongs to the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Eternal life belongs to those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Eternal life is experienced and lived in by the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Eternal life belongs to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Eternal life belongs to the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Eternal life belongs to the pure in heart, for they will see God. Eternal life is experienced by the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Eternal life belongs to those who are persecuted, because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Eternal life belongs to you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of Jesus. I think if we're understanding this vision of the good life, it looks very different than the good life according to the standards of the world. Where the world would say, no, your life is truly good if you've got it made. If you are wealthy and you want for nothing, if you are powerful, who cares if you hurt people along the way? It's about getting what's yours. Jesus steps into the scene in a world that is so, so 
infatuated with hedonism and wealth and prosperity. And the kingdom that he proclaims looks a lot more like this. That no, the, the good life, eternal life, my life, is that you would be humble and poor in spirit and understand that you don't have anything to offer God. That you would hunger and thirst for righteousness that you would look around at the state of the world, that you would look at at children dying of starvation, of bombs falling on civilians, of people dying of cancer and sickness, and you would say, God, make it right again. That, That is eternal life, to be longing for God's kingdom here and now, and to become an active agent of that kingdom by participating in God's life through Christ. You tracking with me? If our, if our good news about Jesus simply saves people from eternal damnation but doesn't save them from what they're going through today, it's not great news. In John chapter 10, as Jesus is describing abundant life that he came to bring, he juxtaposes that with a character that uh, he calls the thief. And he says, the thief comes to steal and rob and destroy, but I have come that you would have life and have it abundantly. Abundant eternal life in Jesus that is available to you and I today, starting right now, means that come the thief, come the deceiver, the tempter, the adversary, whatever name you want to apply to that snake in the garden that got us in this mess, whatever he wants to do cannot take away our joy, our peace, our comfort, our hope, because it is Christ. What is the reward for following Jesus? It's it's Jesus. It's him. The good news of Jesus is not simply that we don't have to suffer an eternal separation from God, but that he came announcing the kingdom that is breaking through the kingdoms of this world that exist and that we can live in that today and that we can be that kingdom today. I know this is a lot. I feel like I'm shooting a fire hose at y'all and asking you to drink from it. So thank you for dealing with me. But we're, we're gonna move into a, a time of reflection and response here. And I wanna make this incredibly practical for us. Um, because like I said earlier, it's not enough to just know about God. It's not enough to just know about Jesus, but we need to know him relationally and transformatively. So it's not enough to just drop some facts and some fancy terms and Greek words on you and get off the stage. No, we've got to allow room for the Holy Spirit to do the work that he wants to do this morning. So there are, there are really three people that I want to speak to this morning, or three categories of people if you will. First, maybe this is not old news to you. Maybe like, maybe you've, or maybe this is old news to you. Maybe you've heard this all before, right? Like you read N.T. Wright, you've got it figured out. But if you were to be honest with yourself and, and really look at your life, you would say, I don't feel like I'm experiencing the abundant life that Jesus promised. I don't, I don't feel as connected to his life as I should. There's some tension there. There are, there are doubts and questions. There's, there's pain there. My encouragement to you during these next few minutes is that you, you would allow him to, like a doctor, to press on the pain to identify where it is and you'd, you'd let him heal it. 
that he would draw you into union with him in a way that you didn't know you could experience. Not by chasing spiritual highs and and charismatic experiences or revelations or anything like that, but by aligning your will to his through surrender. The second person I want to talk to is, is the person that, and maybe this is you, but you, you, you showed up today not expecting to have your entire paradigm of what you thought Jesus taught about flipped upside down. Maybe you do see eternal life as simply going to heaven when we die. And this is, this is a lot for you. I, I get it. I get it. My encouragement for you this morning would be to just sit and meditate on Jesus' words, not on mine. He's the one who said that eternal life is knowing God and knowing him. So don't get mad at me. But I would encourage you to just take these moments and just let him work on you. Soften you up a little. Allow you to move from this paradigm to this one of of eternal life now. Because I want you to think for a second, like what, what would our world look like if we as Christians truly believed and lived out that Jesus's eternal life, God's life and essence is available to us today? What if we truly believe that we are agents of the kingdom of God, that we are agents of this eternal life and our mission is to go out and proclaim that good news to people? But to get there, we have to start with allowing Jesus to change us. The last person that I wanna talk to you this morning is you, if you, uh, maybe you're not a follower of Jesus. Like you're here this morning because it's Memorial Day weekend in Myrtle Beach and you made some horrible decisions last night. (laughs) You woke up feeling shame and guilt. We laugh because we've all been there, by the way. You woke up feeling shame and guilt and you Googled a church so that you could try to ease your conscience of that. Maybe you've just been coming and hanging out for a while because somebody brings you with them or invited you. Whatever that case is, you need to know that the good news of Jesus is that you don't have to wait until you die to experience eternal life. The good news of Jesus is that he laid his life down willingly to give you his life. That you can experience peace and comfort and joy now. I can't promise you that your situation will get better, but I can promise you that you will be happy in it joyful and at peace. Because the good news of Jesus is that the kingdom of God has broken through and is available for us to live in here and now. And it's available. It's available to you today. You surrender your will to his Acknowledge Christ as as truly the king that he is over your life. That's how you live in the kingdom of God. You live under the rule and reign of a different king. Whatever category you fall into this morning, or if you don't fall into one of those three at all, that's, that's fine. We all need to take this time to allow the Holy Spirit to work on us. One thing that we do here during this time is we just like to give space and margin 
Because in a world of push notifications and pop-ups and electronic billboards, there's not a lot of margin anymore. So we're going to just create space for God to do whatever he wants to do in and through us. If you want to come up and pray at one of the kneelers, you're welcome to. If you want to come light a candle as you pray, you're, do it. Communion is available over against the wall over there. That is, that is a very tangible way to experience union with God is by partaking of the body and blood of Christ. But more than any of the practical, tangible things that we're going to do, we're just going to sit and let him move. And then we'll worship together and we'll get out of here. Thank you again for joining us online. We hope you enjoyed the message. To connect with us, you can follow us on Instagram or Facebook. For more information on who we are, check out our website, midtownvineyardchurch.com. We'd love to hear from you. Make sure you leave us a review or drop us a comment. Until next time, have a great day. Thank you.